excuse me. <clears throat> First of all, don't forget the fifth scene tomorrow night, right? And that's up. Um, Mount Crest United <clears throat> Six o'clock central. Six Are you going towards and Fall Creek Falls? You go up towards Fall Creek Falls, and on top, there, on the slide, you'll see a little elementary school about halfway. You talking about the football? No. no. I'll get you. Di I'll get you directions. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll send yeah. you directions. If anybody else wants directions, please get in touch with me. My name's in the bulletin there. Uh, the other thing I want you to be thinking about, folks, we are getting very, very close to this uh, banquet that's going to be September the 12th um, up at Fall Creek Falls we uh, Welcome Center. That banquet's very important. Uh, all of our focus between now and then needs to be on leading up to that. Now, a vital part of this is going to be the elders visiting every church member or some of you that just visit. We're going to come and visit with you and explain it to you. Next week, I'm going to bring you a pamphlet that we have that will help explain a lot of this. The other thing that's very vital, and I've reached out to a few people, we need three uh, folks and I nominated them in the board meeting to be part of the telephone committee. Uh, so uh, that committee will be calling everyone to kind of let them know that we'll be coming. I don't know that we'll be able to set uh, a time or make an appointment because we've got so many people to, to visit during that time. Now this will all, there will be training for both the elders and this telephone committee after potluck on August the 12th. That's just a couple of weeks away. So if I've reached out to you about the telephone committee, be there. I, I know Judy was one of them, and Judy's kind of helping me. We may expand this or, or whatever, but uh, that's a very important piece of this program. Hey, Abby. Yes. You were earlier talking about changes. Uh-huh. It is uh, the, <laughs> yeah, thank you for uh, me. I, whatever's in the bulletin, I think, is correct. Uh, that may be the 17th. Yes, we had it set for the 12th and couldn't get it. So I think it is the 17th. Thank you for pointing that out. All right. Um, are there any other announcements I need to know about, that we need to know about? Okay, we'll continue with the service. Okay, next we have our meditation song, Jesus Name Above All Names.
Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we enter into this time of worship because we love you. And we love you, Lord, because you first loved us. Lord, today we come with you to, to you, perhaps with some heavy hearts, some things that we need to take care of. But Lord, for the next few moments, we pray that we'll lay that all aside and turn our eyes towards Jesus. We pray, O oh God, that our speaker, LeClaire Litchfield, as he brings the message that God has laid upon his heart, that our ears might be open to hear, and that you would bless him with a measure of your spirit. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our opening song today is song number 250. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. We'll sing uh, the first, second, and the uh, sixth verse. This is a time for you to bring your prayer requests that we may pray as a church for whatever those might be, and also to give testimony of what the Lord has done for you, either this week or at any time. <laughs> the, all right. I want to praise the Lord for getting uh, Nate and I both through the week. And... Uh, I was really super sick yesterday, but he made it to where I can come today. Um, we also want to pray for my family, lift up my daughter and son-in-law and grandkids, but all my family. And we also want to pray for Nate's mother to be able to get a home so she can have her children back. And we want to pray for Nate's brother, which is Joshua, because there's a good chance that he might get out of the facility in a month because he's doing really well. And there could be a chance that he's coming to my house. So we just want to praise and um Thank the Lord. Amen. I got a phone call this morning to take over Donald's job here, and he says, uh, special for Denise has trouble with the ribs. Denise. Yes. His okay. wife. Okay. I just, I guess for me, it's a thanks for safe travel. We, in two days, we drove 1,600 miles and um, only one, um, one night of sleep in there. So I know there's times where I should not have been driving. And the fact that we got back safely, I'm really appreciative for. Oh, yeah. Amen. Lester's sister, Teresa, uh, is married to Billy Frank Angel, and his brother had a horrific accident that killed him this week on the bulldozer. Oh, wow. um, unexpected and is very tragic. So let's just keep the entire family in our prayers. What's the family's name? His name was Roy Joe Angel. Okay. <clears throat> okay, are there any others? 
I one um, <coughs> okay. while Tony was <coughs> lifting up Denise in prayer, I wanted to lift Tony's wife, Linda. I know she had a biopsy done yesterday. There's been a growth in her thyroid. The doctors had been watching. <coughs> And we just want to pray that everything is okay with Linda. Linda, yes, okay. All right, any others? Okay, if not, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Sorry, guys. Lord God, we know that you know these prayer requests before we even open our mouth. We thank you that you're that kind of God that anticipates our needs ahead of time, and that even though we may not request things, that you're there anyway, that you just show up. Lord, we wanna pray for uh, little Nate and his mother and brother. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, give that family exactly what they need to be a family. And bless um, Stephanie and her Family, I know that she has a great burden for her children. Oh, Lord, make a difference in their lives, I ask. And, Lord, we pray for uh, the sister, Ter Teresa, uh, or Roy. We pray for Roy uh, and his family. I know that uh, he rests in peace now, but, Lord, make this uh, family uh, come to feel your presence of peace and comfort during this time. For, Lord, you are the God of all comfort. And, Lord, we pray for Linda. Uh, whatever that biopsy is there, Lord, we pray that it will be benign, that uh, she will glorify you in this moment of healing. And, Lord, I pray for those that have, are here that are experiencing troubles in their lives, things that they just can't figure out, things that are bothering them so badly that they want to just run and scream. But, Lord, I pray that you would run to them and show them that you care. Give them a, a way, a plain path that they can see, that they can walk and follow you. Lord, teach us to follow you. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's children's story time, and my favorite storyteller, <laughs> Jeff, will come up here.
in that bucket. And what we had to really get well, but something happened. One day, all of a sudden, we didn't have any water. And it's gone. You got water. I don't have water. And you can't flush the toilet. You know, that takes water. You can't run the, the washer. You can't do the dishes. Yeah, so water is very important. And all of a sudden, we didn't have that. Yeah, mamas re require a lot of water to give a lot of the fat to them. Uh, but anyway, we found out that the pump went out as well. It's a submersible pump. Okay, a submersible pump is probably about that big, like a tube. And it goes all the way down underneath the water in this well, a pipe about this long. And it ours go down about 170, 180.
Yeah, I can testify to that uh, little story. That was uh, scary. I could see thousands of dollars running through my head to, to dig. So praise God, he saved us some money there. Um, today's offertory, the uh, loose offering will go to church budget. Uh, let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll take this money and bless it, Lord. Use it to your glory and to your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture reading today is from Philippians 1, verses 1 through 10. This will be the basis for Lich's sermon today. I'm looking forward to it. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus in Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, <clears throat> grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every day every time I remember you, and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is, a, it is right for me to feel this way, about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending or confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affliction of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that, you love, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you might be able to discern what is the best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. May God bless his word today in our hearts. Now I think we're going to have special music.
who I've just been in the presence of uh, angels. Uh, I don't know about you, but that just uh, blessed me. So thankful for the entire Lee family and their talents and what they bring to this church, aren't you? Amen. And I appreciate all of you. We all have a part in making this church what it is. And uh, I just want to say I love you guys, no matter who you are, what you are, or anything. You are who you are. God made you that way. Back in the, I don't know, I guess it was the early 90s, I heard a sermon at the campus church. Have you ever had one of those sermons that you can almost repeat yourself? You hear it has such an influence on you that you can repeat it. Such a sermon came from this man right here, LeClaire Litchfield. I call him Litch. I think his friends call him Litch. Um, he preached on the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And what he said in that sermon just brought me to tears. He says, sometimes... You're leaving Jerusalem, and you're all discouraged. You just came from watching your leader die on a cruel cross, and you know, the last thing you're doing is praying. You're, uh, you're in your misery, and I'm paraphrasing here, brother. So, But he says, when you're in that position, Jesus shows up. And I think you hit the, the podium like that, too. <laughs> Got my attention. Sometimes Jesus shows up. You didn't pray for it, but he shows up. And why does he do that? Because he loves you. He knows before you ask what your needs are. This man here uh, married uh, Judy and I on the uh, mountain in Chattanooga, Signal Mountain, back in uh, uh -oh, 2013. <laughs> I almost forgot there. 2013. <laughs> uh, that's a long story to that, but anyway... <laughs> We really appreciate Leclerc and his, or Litch and his uh, sermons. You're going to be blessed. Just want you to open your ears and what the Spirit has to say. Well, I've already heard some laughter in this church. Is that okay? Yeah. You better believe it. You better believe it. There's the youngest member right back there. Look. How old? Four days. Four what? Four days. Four days? Wow. Yeah, four days really work for you. <laughs> <laughs> who's, the, who's the member who's been here the longest in this church? Right here? How many years? No kidding. How many years? <laughs> really? Wow. Um, were you born in Pikeville? No, I was born in Portland, Tennessee. Portland. All right. Is there still, I'm asking you now these questions. You've been around. Uh, is there still a, um, like a boy's home here or? Uh, they closed the. the uh, what was it called? Yeah. Uh, they closed it 10 years ago. Okay. Because when I was young, I came here for, uh, I think, six weeks and did a practicum there. Yeah, I wasn't inside the prison. Oh. I was visiting, yeah. <laughs> uh, just, just really enjoyed it. And so when I was driving here to Pikeville today, I was thinking about that, that situation. I was going to be a social worker. And uh, before that, I was, gonna, I was going into business. And... Uh, then I went as a student missionary to a little place called England. And uh, luckily, they did no spiritual screening, or they would have never let me go, because I, I saw a piece of scratch paper on the southern boys' dorm wall. It said, fly to England, get your airfare together, all expenses paid for a year. I said, travel, no work, that must be God's plan for me. <laughs> uh, and uh, so 12 of the weirdest personalities uh, went over to England, to try to breathe life into a couple of churches over there in Devon. If you know England very well, Cornwall's down at the bottom and then Devonshire. And uh, they thought if they got some loud Americans over there, something could happen, you know. And, and, uh, but despite my motivation for going, that was a renaissance in my life, an epiphany, or whatever term you want to use. I'd always grown up hearing about Jesus and God, and, and I, thought, I always thought I had things figured out. But when I went over there, 
these fanatics said, we want you to go door to door. Help me, Jesus. I prayed that no one would be home. <laughs> the Lord did not answer that prayer. Someone was home. I prayed that they didn't, this sounds terrible, I know. I prayed they didn't want a Bible study, but the Lord didn't answer that prayer. They wanted a Bible study. And so ever so gradually, the beautiful thing about God is He meets us where we are. What a relief. He meets us where we are. That is so important for the church. God doesn't care where you've been, what you've done, who your folks are. He meets you where you are. That's a good God. And so I was sitting out in the courtyard, got bombed by a seagull right here. And I was reading a little book, maybe you've heard of it, called Desire of Ages. Not for a quiz and life and teachings, not for any reason, but just to read it. And uh, that afternoon someone said, hey, we need you to go preach at a church. What? So of course, being the compliant child my father taught me to be, I said, sure, I'll go do that. And they were, they were good Christians. They listened and forgave me of all my ignorance. By the way, I'm still ignorant. And they'll get up, but he could so are you. The good book says there's none righteous, no, not one. Or when I'm talking to teenagers, I say, when you think you're hot, you're not. <laughs> and then they asked me to go preach somewhere else. And then I flash back to when I was about five years old, standing on the piano bench, not playing as good as you, but just standing on the bench, and preaching to my grandma. So it took God to get me out of the holy city of Collegedale to go to England Grew up in a place called Tacoma Park, where my dad was in the general conference, not just a big cheese, just a little guy. Went to school with a guy named Teddy Wilson. He was the president of SA. I was vice president. You can call him Elder, Elder Wilson to you. If you don't know who that is, he's the president of the general conference. Teddy and I still don't agree on everything. No. So I did that for a year. And then um, talked to the conference president and said, hey, I, if you'd pay me 50 quid, that's pounds to you, 50 quid a month, let me stay in this flat underneath the church, I'll do this for another year. He said, no, you need to go to Newbold. That's a college outside of London. I said, no, I'm a slow learner. I've been in college for five years. I'm not going to Newbold. Sent me another letter. said, go to Newbold. We'll pick up the tab. Oh, that might be God's will. <laughs> So I went to Newbold. The problem with England is they don't just say read a book and vomit it back. They say read a book and, and tell us what you think. What in the world? What kind of education is that? <laughs> so I took theology. had a, a, a teacher by the name of Jan Paulson. I don't know if you're into church politics, but he was a general conference president years ago, a theologian. He was probably six foot 13. I mean, he was a huge, huge guy. And so refreshing, because he was so real and so gentle, and yet firm. I, I could go on, but we're not here to talk about me. I'm a third-generation Adventist. I grew up in Review and Herald diapers. I, 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 I heard all this stuff. You know what I mean by heard all this stuff? But there has to come a point in your life when you say, this is mine. It's not mommy and daddy's. It's mine. You have to understand, too, I'm a child of the 60s, which is a problem, okay? Because I question everything. Question everything. In fact, this will scare you or make you uncomfortable. When someone says, what are you? I say, I'm a Christian protesting Seventh-day Adventist. Well, what's that, Pastor? What are you protesting? Well, first of all, let's go back to the Word. 
protesting means Protestant. God has a sense of humor. Who did he choose to kick off the, 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 the Reformation? A Roman Catholic priest. God's got a sense of humor. Who did he get to write most of the New Testament? A guy who killed Christians. His name was Paul. Don't you ever tell me God isn't open. The openness of God is not just a book. That's God. He's open. Turning your Bibles, please. Good luck. Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Not Zechariah. Zephaniah. Right toward the back of the Old Testament. Zephaniah. Hosea, Joey, Mesobadiah, Jonah, Micah, and the back of Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. That was a song I learned in Sabbath school. It still uses it, still use it today. Zephaniah. Anybody there yet? Okay. And if you didn't bring your Bible, you can still go to heaven, but it's good to get to know your Bible. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 3. I'm beginning with verse 14. You with me? Chapter 3, verse 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. By the way, you're spiritual Israel if you've given your heart to Christ. Be glad and rejoice with all your what? Heart. O daughter of Jerusalem, the Lord has taken away your what? Punishment. Anybody need to hear that this morning? The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back who? Your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. That's Emmanuel. We sang that. God with us. Never again will you fear any harm. Anybody afraid? Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say, Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. Whoa, 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 whoa. Do not let your hands hang limp? What does that mean? Good. I'm comfortable with that. Idle. Don't let your hands hang limp. You know, I picture when Jesus comes. Do you mind me going to that picture for a minute? When Jesus comes, I picture some avenues going like this. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm being facetious. When Jesus comes, you're not going to have to tell me. I'm not going to have to tell you. We're going to look up, and, and I don't know if we're going to say, Lo! But our hands are going to go like this. Well, you're Pentecostal? Yeah, I'm Pentecostal. Amen. What is Pentecostal? Holy Spirit possessed. Po you're possessed? There's nothing wrong with the word possessed. It's who you're possessed by. And by the way, if you're possessed, you don't tell, I'm possessed with the Holy Spirit. Just like if you fasted, you don't tell anybody you fasted. Next time you fast, don't tell anybody. Jesus says, wash your face, wash your hair, and don't tell anybody. Now, if you just told someone you were fasting, just don't do it again, okay? <laughs> if you fast, we'll figure it out. You don't have to tell us. And quite frankly, in my opinion, do what you want. If I see someone I've been praying for, I don't go up to them and say, I've been praying for you. Now, please, if they're, if they're in crisis, if it's Roy's family, you're going to say, I've been praying. You're going to reach out and tell them. It's, I don't think we do it on purpose, but I think it's sometimes we brag about our holiness. No offense, but we've got nothing to brag about because the only holiness we have is God's holiness. What am I protesting? I'm protesting when you give your heart to Christ, you don't kiss your brains goodbye. You continue to study the word, not to get more saved. There's another topic, Adventist. Not to get more saved, because once you come to Christ, you're covered. Covered with his life, whiter than snow. You're covered. That's too good to believe. So I got done with New Bowl, and I said to Shelly, who I dated when I was, I was 18, she was 15. That sounds terrible. 18 and 15. Maybe I was 17. Anyway, we're there's three years apart. I'm three years older. And I said, hey, will you marry me and come to England? It's a package deal. <laughs> Look what she said. 
let me think about it for three days and don't tell anybody you asked me. <laughs> the male ego just got stomped. It took her two days and she did say yes. And so 47 years later, we're still together. I said, come with me. No, I'm not coming with you today. I gotta do something else. So we went to England and pastored for three years. One year at New Bowl, one student, yeah, that's there for five years. Pastor for three years. The saints forgave us of our sins because they knew we were young and ignorant. The people thought we were with IBM. They never heard of Seventh-day Adventists. One guy says, what are you? He said, Seventh-day Adventists. He says, I hope you get over it. <laughs> so now I say, I'm a, to someone who's not an Adventist, I'll say, I'm a Christian Seventh-day Adventist. Because you've heard this before. No denomination saves anybody. Jesus saved. When I baptize someone, I don't go like this. I baptize you into the Seventh Day Adventist Church. I baptize you into Jesus Christ. I hope you fellowship with the Seventh Day Adventist Church. But no denomination saves anybody. I've been saying that for 47 years, and no one has thrown me out. So if I've offended you, I'm sorry. Do I still believe in the Sabbath? Yes, but the Sabbath doesn't save you. Do I still believe in not eating pork? Yeah, but hamburger doesn't save you. Neither does veggie burger. There's one thing that saves you, and that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't worship, listen clearly, I don't worship the Seventh day Adventist Church, I worship in an Adventist Church. I don't worship the Sabbath, I worship the Lord of the Sabbath. I don't even worship the Scripture, I read the Scripture because the Scripture is the Word, but Jesus is the living Word. Some people say, oh, if I can just find some mistakes in the Bible, I can throw out the Bible. There are mistakes in the Bible. Sit down. Why? Because anything man touches gets messed up. I'll give you one example. This doesn't part of the sermon. Don't take my time. In Samuel it says, Saul, King Saul saw the enemy coming, so he said to his armor bearer, bad story for the kids, run me in, kill me. The animal brother said, I will not. And so the Bible says Saul fell on his sword. Got it? And died. I can take you to another verse where it says God killed Saul. In the Jewish mindset, God was the cause of everything. I can take you to nine verses in, in Exodus where it says Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Pharaoh hardened his heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the way to the Sabbath request is, Pastor, I just believe what the Bible says. Well, it says three things. And so when I have a problem with the blood and guts of the Old Testament, I don't rip out the Old Testament. I run to the New Testament because Jesus said, if you've seen me, what? You've seen the Father. I and my Father are one. And so I say, okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Did Jesus ever go up to someone and say, may your heart be hardened? Of course not. So do I rip out Exodus? No. In the Jewish mindset, let me, hear it, let me say it again. In the Jewish mindset, God was the cause of everything. Now be careful. Because you can go to some other verse where it says, And God sealed Hannah's womb. Remember Hannah praying for a kid? Oh dear God, give me a kid, give me a kid. And then the Bible says, God gave her a kid. Did God seal Hannah's womb? Depends who you talk to. Let me see. Let me go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Did ever Jesus ever go up to a moon and say, may your womb be sealed? No. So please, keep reading the Old Testament. Oh, you're just a New Testament Christian. No. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The clearest picture of God is Jesus. So Jesus holds the, the card. If I have some fuzziness in the Old Testament, I run to Jesus. Okay? By the way, we go into several others. I'll tell you one more. Do you remember in the Old Testament it says, the Holy Spirit impressed David to take a census of his armies. Okay? But I can show you another verse that says, the Holy Spirit impressed David to take a census. Well, if there's mistakes in the Bible, you can just shove it. No, 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 no. It's not a house of cards. Well, where do you get your support? Let's feel well. I don't worship Ellen White, but I believe she, she gave proper information, okay? There's four kinds of Adventists with Ellen White. Let me just touch on that for a minute. There's four kinds of Adventists. You're in one of these categories. The first kind of Adventist puts Ellen White on top of Scripture. Have you met them? 
They're sincere. God loves them, but incorrect. The second kind of Adventist holds Ellen equal with Scripture. They're getting closer, but they're still incorrect. The third kind of Adventist quotes Ellen and says, Ellen is the lesser light shining to the greater light. The fourth kind of Adventist does this with Ellen because they've been around this one too long. Does anyone catch what I'm saying? Oh, he doesn't believe in Ellen. Don't you dare say that. God used the steps to Christ and desire of ages to bring me to Jesus. But we do not, let me say this slowly, we do not go to Ellen for doctrine. She is not doctrinal. If she was doctrinal, then we are what people say we are. Oh, Adventists are just a cult. We are hardcore Christian people. Most people who know us now realize that. They also know we're still sinners because they've met some of them. Yeah, so... so <laughs> Christians, all right? So, there are people who believe if they can find one mistake in the Bible, you can just chuck Christianity. Here's what Ellen White says. Anything we touch as human gets messed up. So when they did their interpreting, and they, they wrote scripture, you know, and they went with the Jewish mindset, God was the cause of everything. Why did God do that? Because when Israel came out of man, am I all over the place? When Israel came out of Egypt, remember they were in Egypt for so long, and everything that moved, the Egyptians worshipped. They worshipped crocodiles. They worshipped cats. They worshipped dogs. They worshipped the Nile River. You would too if you lived in a desert. Oh, Nile. And so God says, let's keep it simple. Did God need to do this the sanctuary thing? Did He need to do that? No. God always meets us. What? Where we are. So he goes into all this detail about get the pomegranates on the bomb, have a most holy place. God did all of that because he knew that these, these Israelites had watched the Egyptians worship everything, so he met us where we were. He said, okay, let them build me a sanctuary, what? That I may dwell among them. So he knew that around them their cultures were worshipped. It was easy to get for God to get to get. Israel out of Egypt, it was more difficult for God to get Egypt out of Israel. And don't feel too uppity because it's the same problem in the culture you're in. You're in a culture that says Christians are judgmental, hypocrite, homophobic. There's a whole, there's a whole list of what the man in the street in Pikeville, if there's any, because we're in the Bible Belt, that believe about Christians. And so the first thing you're going to say as an Adventist is nothing. You're just going to be Jesus. Amen. Don't bore me with your theology. Be Jesus. And then someone will come up to you and say, what makes you tick? At which point, they don't want 28 fundamental thoughts. They want this. Here it is. Jesus is Lord of my life. Is he? Jesus is Lord of my life. I'm not going to say shut up because you don't say that in church. You say be still. And then be still and then go back to them. I pick up a Muslim. What's the first thing I say? Are you a Muslim? No. I say, how are you doing? Good. Interesting name. What is it? Muslim. Oh. Tell me what you believe. Oh, boy, I'm going to set him up. No, I'm not. Here's what it says, and I think it's Ministry of Healing. Christ mingled with them as one who did desire their good. And when he won their confidence, he said, follow me. People don't give a rip what you believe until they figure out that you give a rip about them. You figured that out with your neighbors. Ah, I call it. You know, I, I, I bumped into some hardcore Adventists and they just, I just see it one way. God bless them. God bless them. Paul says, if we ever get to it, if on some points you think differently, God will make it clear. If you're having issues with what I'm saying right now, you don't have to agree with me. You're supposed to love me. Well, yeah, I don't even know you. If on some point. Let's take a look quickly. I didn't even get to the verse yet. Oh, we're still in Zephaniah. Uh, he will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with what? Singing. 
I never pictured God singing over me. I pictured God like this. I pictured when I walked into the Hyattsville, Maryland church and we'd sing this song. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his holy temple. I knew the purpose for that song was to shut us up when we came into church. Be quiet. Be reverent. Hey, reverence can be very loud. Come with me to the second coming. If your loved ones are coming out of the grave, the angels are blowing their trumpets. Jesus is coming. We're going to lift up our Pentecost. Don't let your hands. Here he comes. Here he comes. It's all true. This is, this is not some. It's really a second. There, there he is right there. He's, he's, he's smiling. God is smiling. God is smiling. God is smiling. God is smiling. Remember these verses. Enter into his courts with what? Joy and thanksgiving. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Paul writes from a urine, rat, roach-infested prison and, and, and says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Hey, happiness and joy, two different words. When I'm talking to teenagers, I say, you're going to Disney World, you're happy. The lines are long at Space Mountain, you're unhappy. There's a cute girl in front of you, she's looking at you, you're happy. She's got a seven-foot boyfriend looking at you, you're unhappy. <laughs> when they lowered my mom into the grave, are you with me with your loved one you're thinking of? When they lowered our loved one in the grave, we were unhappy. But we still had joy. Because the world can't give you joy. What? And the world can't take it away. And so that heavy verse where Paul says in Corinthians, Jesus, for the joy set before him. In other words, he had you on your mind as he goes to the cross. He says, hey, this is going to be tough. And what did he say on the cross? My God, my God. He's quoting from Psalms. Why have you what? Forsaken me. Your pastor did a series on the, the phrases of Christ on the cross. Had God forsaken him? No. God was right next to him. But don't ask me to explain this. But because of the pain and the, and, the, and, the, and the sin and the guilt and the world, Jesus said, I just don't feel your presence. And at that point, he didn't say, Abba, Father. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David didn't even know as he was writing that, as he was feeling that, Jesus would memorize it and use it on the cross. But the neat thing is, God had not forsaken. So when people say to me, they, and they say this all the time, Pastor, I just don't feel the Lord's presence. I want to say to them, so? Because we don't live by feelings. Feelings come, and feelings go, and feelings are deceiving. I'll trust alone, this will make you feel better, in the whole word of God, old and new, because nothing else is worth believing. Let's just buzz through Philippians real quick here now. Philippians is my favorite book. It's the book of joy. And I think it's, check, check, count it yourself, but I think he mentions it 16 times, the word joy. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. What's the first promise in Philippians? Someone read it to us. It's verse 5 or 6. Someone read it if you got it. Thank you. He's got it right on the screen. What a guy. 5 or 6. Being confident. Yeah, there it is. I always pray with joy. How do you pray with joy? If I stood up in college, the old church, and started going like this for prayer. Ha, ha, ha. Hello, Father. That would be the last time they'd ask me to pray in front of the church. What does it mean to pray with joy? Here's another song that comes to my mind. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory. By the way, every time you see the word glory, nine times out of ten it means God's character. Jesus said to the, in John 17, reveal your glory through me. 
Here's the first promise. He who has begun being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, he will carry out the work in you until he comes to get you. So put by your Bible, unless you write, don't write in your Bible, he, he, he. He begins the work, he carries on the work, he comes to get you. Oh, you want some heavy words? Okay, justification, sanctification, glorification. Let's keep it simple, saints. Get with Jesus, grow with Jesus, go with Jesus. That's it. That's the first promise. What's the gospel? Don't just say, it's the good news. That tells me nothing. What's the gospel? Here we go. The birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. Then we quickly skip to the second coming of Christ, leaving that one small detail. We've got to start over. The birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit of Christ. That's where we are right now. And then the second coming and get us out of here, Christ. That's the gospel. Well, that's what all Christians believe. That's good. And whenever I preach, there's always someone who comes up to me at the end. You can tell. They come up like a shark, <laughs> circling. <laughs> One guy came up and he said, Pastor, and I didn't, I didn't have good devotions that day, and I said, excuse me, do we know each other? Well, no. Well, where do you live? He says, Wildwood. Well, I live close to Wildwood. Let's go out for lunch. He said, that'd be good, but first I need to tell you something. Didn't work. I went through the Gospel of John, John, John 11, this is the story of Lazarus, my favorite story. And so I didn't say, turn in your Bibles to John 11. So his problem was I didn't have anybody turn in the Bible, and I need to start doing that. I was so, by the way, I, I, I wrestled with selfishness, pride, ego, and I pout a lot. Okay, check with my wife, all right? Uh, so I was so ticked off at him that the next night I got up to speak, this was a June Alaska Lake with the, with the gray hairs, and, and he said, I said, turn in your Bibles to John 15, I am the vine. Wasn't that terrible? That was just diaper behavior of me, hoping he was there to hear that. Um, but was he right? Sure, it's good to open the Bible. But if you already know the John, anyway. Um, so what happens? Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you. The devil says, you're no good. You're a hypocrite. You're a one-day Christian. Every one of you in here has some stuff in your life that the devil keeps throwing back on you. If we ever got to Philippians 3, that's the key chapter of the whole book. Paul says this. It's ridiculous. Forgetting what is behind and pressing on toward what is ahead. Hey, Paul, you got some guilt. Because things I want to forget, I can't forget. Things I want, don't want to forget, I forget. So I think what you're saying is, you probably killed some Christians, and every time you take steps closer to Christ, Satan reminds you of your past. Some of you are old enough to remember the singer Carmen, the Christian singer. He said, when Satan reminds you of your past, you remind Satan of his future. You got it. You know the song. When you know that, Great peace have they that love his law. Law. Yeah, law is God's character. Law. And nothing shall offend them. I haven't gotten to that point yet. <laughs> nothing shall offend them. I get offended so easily. I am so judgmental. Anybody in here judge? No, don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> We're all judgmental. God delivers from ourselves. First promise. Let's go over it again. He who has begun a good work in you will continue the work in you until he comes to get you. Now, here's what you do. I'm going to teach you how to do something. I think it's biblical. It's called pray reading. So just look at those verses. It'll revolutionize your prayer life. I want you to, for the next 30 days, take the book of Philippians and read it every day. Read it every day. Just a little bit at a time. If you come to something you don't understand, listen to this heresy. Skip it. So here we go. I'm going to pray read with you. Just keep your eyes open and watch the verse. Jesus, put more thankfulness in me, please. And remind me of yourself throughout the day. Teach me to pray with joy. I'm so blessed. I have food falling out of my, my refrigerator. I have a roof over my head. I have air conditioning. How dare I whine or complain about anything? Put joy in me. Why? Because you want to call it a partnership. You want me to be a partner in your gospel. I can't be a partner. I'm the chief of sinners. 
wait a minute. Paul says in the beginning of the book of Philippians, he says, to the saints in Philippi. And if I ask you right now, are you a saint? Most of you are going to go, no, I'm not. Yes, we are. In Christ. That's Paul's favorite phrase. In Christ. He says it 160 times. In Christ. That means in him. That means here's the book. Here's the bulletin. Wherever the, bu- wherever the bulletin is, the book. Because it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. You're in Christ. And he considers you covered with his righteousness. So you're a saint. You're a servant. My brilliant, most brilliant grandson I have, five years old, he's sitting at the breakfast table with Shelly, my brilliant wife, and he says, Lovey, does God want to control us? And she, being the brilliant teacher, she says, well, what do you think? He says, well, he's kind of the boss. And Shelly said, but in John 15, 15, it says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. We're four things, folks. We're servants, we're friends, we're saints if you're in Christ. How do I know? Because he said to the saints in Corinth, and then he starts listing their sins. Oh yeah, I forgot one other thing you are. A sinner. You can't be a sinner and a saint at the same time. Oh yes, you can. Oh yes, you can. Because you can be in Christ, covered by him, and still be struggling things in your life. And you know why? Because you have a sinful nature. And Christ, heard my bulletin go, and Christ covers you with his life. Have you heard this song? Covered with his life, whiter than snow, fullness of his life. What? Then shall I know my life of scarlet, my sin and woe. Covered with his life. And guess what? Ellen says in Steps to Christ, the closer you get to Christ, the more you know there's nothing hot about you. She doesn't say it exactly like that. The closer you get to Christ, you know the only righteousness you have is his. So folks, we got a dilemma. We better finish it. I get close to Christ, I realize I'm not, but I'm a saint. Then you go to Skinny John, and here's what it says. You'll recognize it. 1 John 5. Let me tell it this way. I go into, I uh, pastor at Knoxville for five years, I go into uh, St. Mary's Hospital, and here's a guy dying of a brain tumor. His name is John. Good name. I said, John, why? this is a stupid question for a pastor to ask, but I knew the guy so I could say this. He's got a brain tumor in the hospital, and I ask him this stupid question. John, why are you crying? And he says, I'm not going to heaven. I said, who told you? He said, well, I smoke. I said, where's the verse that says smokers won't be in heaven? Well, it's not there. Well, but the church says, well, the church says. Okay, well, how many Oreo blizzards did the pastor have? You know, oh, oh, what, what are you going to do? Let's go to Skinny John. Here's what it says. I'll do it slow. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the Lord that you know that you have eternal life. Oh, we don't believe in one saved always. That's not what I'm saying. At any point, I can flip God off and walk away and I'm lost. But if you have given your heart to Christ, you're covered with His robe of righteousness. And as Venden would say, Christ is in the process of saving me. That makes Adventists feel a little bit better because Ellen said, don't ever say you're saved. She was talking about once saved, always saved, not in a saving relationship. And I grew up in this myth, I hope none of you did, that you better be perfect before Jesus comes. And if you need to be perfect before Jesus comes, we are all, I won't use a bad word, had. We're had. Perfect means maturing, growing in Christ. We'll close with this one, I promise. Moses, what's the last thing Moses did before he died? He said, must we bring water out of this rock? And he struck the rock. And Satan cussed, as only Satan should. Cuss, 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 he's mine, cuss it. And so God 
Please, my imagination, I think it's biblical. That's dangerous. He walks with God up to Mount. God shows him the promised land. And then God says something that God never says. Lay down. Go to sleep. And Moses dies. Satan is dancing on the grave. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. And then God says, Satan, he died. Yes, he did. And God says, Moses, I don't know if he sang it. Arise, my love. Arise, my love. The grave no longer has a hold on thee. King James. Moses goes up to heaven. Who's in heaven now? Good biblical information. Moses, Elijah, Enoch. I don't know how his wife felt about that. Enoch. Poor Moses. He didn't get to go to Lake Winnipesoka. He had to go to heaven. And what was the last thing he did? Must we, God and I, bring water out of this rock? Seems a little harsh, God. No, no. Moses was a big leader. Moses had to go to sleep. Why do I love that story? Because I already told you. I'm critical. I'm proud. I'm meant that none of, the, none of your business. But I'm saved by Jesus Christ. Amen. And so are you. Amen. So please, perfect. Whenever you hear the word perfect, you put the word growing in Christ. Please, what God wants to do in you is his business. Your business is to say, I give you my heart. The purpose for church every week here is to huddle and to encourage each other. Amen. If on some point you think differently, I don't have to see it as you do. What a relief. And you don't have to see it as I am. And I'm not going to be here next week, so you can chew me up then. Because there will be some that have misunderstood me. And you won't follow biblical counsel. You won't come to me directly. You'll go talk to someone else. And, and you're not a real man or a real woman. You're just a judge. And you don't scare me anymore. Because I'm in love with Christ. And if I've offended you, I'm sorry. I didn't even finish my, my sermon. But, but uh, what my challenge for you is I was talking to you about pray reading. As you read the scripture, pray to God about what you're reading. It'll revolutionize your prayer life. And then go, go through your list. Aunt Bertha, Uncle Fred, all. Go through the list. Don't ask me how prayer works. Nobody knows. But when we pray, God rolls up his sleeve and does more than he wouldn't. You know that by your own testimony. Whether it's a well, whether it's a grieving family. Oh, my goodness. Let's, let's sing our song. We've got so, a song to sing. Thank you for inviting me. N none of you did but Eddie, but thank you, Eddie, for inviting me. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, and I love you. You, you, uh, you got some Pentecostal in you. <laughs> Thanks for singing. You got a good deep voice too. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> good to see you. Play, play, play one more song for us, man. How long have you been taking piano? Nine years. You don't need to look at Dad. You know how long. Good. Nine years. Sorry, I didn't tell you the number. I don't know what it is. Number 76. Oh, that's a good one. Love will not let us go. Love that will not let me go. Song number 76. Shall we stand?
I thought three more things while we were singing. Shelley would not be pleased with me doing this. Um, when I preach, many people come up, a few people come up to me and say, Pastor, what you just said is what all Christian churches believe. Yeah? And Pastor, you just talk about love, love, love. We've got to go deeper than love, Pastor. And what I want to say to that guy is, do you totally understand the love of God? You want to go into something else? Romans 5, 5. You can remember this. Five fingers, five fingers. Here's what it says. God pours his love from his heart to our heart by the Holy Spirit. That verse should be right up there with John 3, 16. Because he just doesn't just pour out his spirit. Here's where he pours out. His love, his peace, his joy, his forgiveness, his salvation, his eternal life, his grace. You name it, he gives it. To, well, what are we supposed to do? Oh, love that will not let me go. You can flip God off. You can run as far as you want. Remember the hound of heaven? He just keeps coming. He just keeps coming. He's not a pushy God. It doesn't say, behold, I stand at the door with a bulldozer. It says, behold, I stand at the door, what? And knock. If anyone open the door, what? I will come in and we will party. I mean, sup, party. Jesus, we've been talking about you. You're such a good God. You are such a good God. Love you. Can't wait to see you. May we give you a God day today. Thank you, Jesus, for the blessed assurance. Jesus is ours. You're such a good God. Whatever's going on in each of the heads and hearts of these people right here, let them know you're crazy about them. And let them know that we just don't worship one day a week. Our life, Romans 12 says, our life is worship. Our life is worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Love to talk with anybody, not argue with anybody, but talk with anyone or pray right up here.